Hi, this is uh, John J. Singleton, and I appreciate you watching this, what I'm going to call free consultation. Um, I'm certainly happy to talk to you on the phone, but I think this is a good use of time so that um, if you have to wait a while to connect with me, you can watch this video and hopefully get a lot of the good information, the most important uh, points that most of us cover in this first conversation about the subject of using a limited liability company to avoid the first risk that most people think of, which is tax liability. And then hopefully, uh, at the end of this free consultation, I want you to understand that taxes are probably the least risk, the least concern of risk. And the biggest concern usually is the lack of knowledge or lack of planning on what to do with capital. So let's start with the tool that I'm using. Now, it can be uh, a trust, it can be uh, a partnership. I like to make it a limited liability company. That's just how I do it. Um, the ownership of it is different. So like, for example, if I get a client that's calling me and he's being sued, and it turns out that he has a personal interest in his company, he's a small business owner, let's say it's an S corporation, and his company's not being sued, but let's say he's being sued by someone for a personal debt. I know right away that if he loses, the creditor can reach into his company and take the money. Why? Because he has 100% ownership interest, or what's called a beneficial interest. So as a remedy, I just simply identify the risk and remove the risk, and then he doesn't have to defend the case. I mean, maybe he want, he'll want to. Maybe there's a reason. But... Defending a case usually is expensive. I mean, it's costly, especially if you need to hire an attorney because it's a corporation that you're defending, and those can't be represented by people. They have to be represented by bar members. So if you can avoid that situation altogether, I think that's, uh, that's the best way to go. So what I'll do in a situation like that is I will have that person file an amendment to the articles, removing himself as the single-member owner, or adding someone with himself, if I remove him, I will replace that single member with a new single member. And the new single member is going to be an association, an unincorporated association. It might be a trust, but it's not that individual. And there's a separation so that what I will do is remove his ownership interest in the shares of the LLC and the membership interest. And then that severs his personal connection or liability to the company. So that way, even if he does lose and there's a writ of attachment for any proceeds he might receive from the LLC, that's the limit of the liability. And ultimately, he controls how that money moves. So really, the treasure that he spent a lot of time building up in that company is now protected simply because we've changed the property rights and we've done it in a way where everyone can see what we've done. What I mean by that is we use the articles that we file with the Secretary of State. Okay, in the United States, we do it this way. The public or the published articles show how the person who's the debtor has no right to the funds or property that's titled in the name of the company. Therefore, all those funds are saved and safe and removed from his personal liability. There's a separation, okay? So I can do that with an unincorporated association. Sometimes we call it a private club, private association. Sometimes they call it a private membership association. Now here's where it gets a little different. I don't write up a legal document to establish what that is. And I know the banks always want one. Now I actually do have a, a document, but uh, it's not necessary because the association that pretty much everyone has can be his family. It can also be all the people in your neighborhood, for example, that, ha that are right-handed or that uh, drive a car, okay? Members of an association have something in common. Well, people in your family are having something in common, and your family is formed by nature. It's not formed by a legal document, so no one can subpoena the document and break it apart and say, ah, your family's not real, therefore it has no property rights, and your family has property rights, if you say so. It just doesn't have any liability because, you know, where a husband and wife have a liability when they file a joint tax return, they have the same liability. Partners in an organization that collectively sign 
a contract making themselves personally liable for the contract have a joint liability. You can have a joint liability. In fact, you can have every member of your family incur a joint liability, but who's really going to do that? That's not even real. Like, how are you going to call up 57 people in your family and have them all sign a contract with the same interest? They're not going to do that, right? It's just unrealistic. So what better group to hold a, pro a privacy right or a property right in than your family? And doing that does not give Uncle Bob any rights over your company. It just he has no divided interest. He has no claim on the property. Nobody in your family does because you've identified your family as a group with no divided interest, and then you're acting in its behalf through the limited liability company. And because you're the signer, you're in fact the trustee for your family. Now, you can call your family anything you want. You can make up any name you want. Now, it doesn't have to be your family. It can be literally business partners, and I've done those before. I've taken a, um, a partnership agreement and made that the private membership association that owns the limited liability company. And again, once again, it just separates out the business interest from the personal interest and everything's protected. It's a firewall, okay? The key thing here is that there's an undivided interest. That's why we can do this with a partnership or a trust, different types of trust. Um, now, let's look at the types of assets. And as you all probably know, if you've read some of my articles, cryptographic currency is not taxable. Why do I know that? Because I cannot pay the tax in the currency. I have to pay it in fiat. I have to pay it in government IOUs, like dollars, okay, pounds, euro dollars. The fact that I have to pay a tax on cryptos in dollars means that cryptos are not taxable. It means dollars are taxable. Nothing's changed. There are no crypto tax laws. I can tell you this in any country. There are no crypto tax laws because if there were taxes on cryptos, you would pay part of your cryptos under the, whatever tax rate it was. Okay. The only thing being taxed is the disposition of an asset and it just happens to be a cryptographic currency as the asset. No different than stock, gold, real estate, you name it, property. That's all it is. The disposition of the property from one owner to another where there's a different interest means there's a disposition of assets. If I did that for dollars, that the dollar value is taxable. Okay. That allows me to move cryptographic currency from wallet to wallet or from coin to coin because there's a couple things going on there. I'm not disposing of the asset, first of all. I'm not trading the asset for a taxable dollar, a taxable unit of a nation's currency. All right? But the more important one that I like is the fact that if I'm doing that, if I'm going from my Litecoin to my Bitcoin and back and forth and whatever a thousand times, I don't care what the thresholds are. That is not a taxable situation ever because the beneficial interests do not change. Okay, there's no sale. If the beneficial interests do not change, there is no disposition of the asset. I have a video on this. It's on the form 8949. You guys can check that out. Um, but I wanted to say this again in this context because you've probably never heard this or you've heard me interviewing uh, on, the, on different uh, channels or read my articles, and so I wanted to go over this just like I would in a first consultation. So the way I set these things up is I write these contracts so that the person who's using them has no liability, has no ownership interest, and can truthfully say that no matter how much property, assets, money, the LLC acquires, uses, or spends, that it's not that person's. So if a client comes to me and he wants to manage cryptographic currency or whatever, and I set it up, and he makes 10 million bucks, that's not his money. He can legally and li literally say that. Um, you can also use the limited liability company, just that one, to manage a myriad of cash flows. You can manage dividends from stock. You can own the stock with it. You can manage rental income. You can sell gold with it. So dollars go to the LLC. You can get 
a list of 1099s every year made out to the LLC, all kinds of different cash flows, rental income, whatever, business income, merchant account income, checks. You can do all that in one LLC in one year. And as long as it's suitable for your organizational purposes, okay, it's not going to be a mess on your, on your accounting because you want some accounting, okay? You want to be able to do accounting. So if you want to separate out your different cash flows, you'll have to be organized. So, But you can use one LLC to manage many types of cash flow. Where we get into the need for maybe using equity stripping or debt or titling of assets or property or liabilities in different companies or trusts is when you start mixing unlike liabilities. An example of that would be if I have an LLC that owns my car and it also owns my church or it owns a helicopter or my house, that's not a good mix. A house with a vehicle or a vessel is not a good mix. A house business owned by the same thing, not a good mix. Two different, wildly different liabilities, risks, sets of risk, okay? But uh, there are uses for an LLC. For example, if I, I could take an LLC, I can have my dividend income through it. I can manage cryptos. I can sell cryptos for dollars. I can avoid a tax liability. And at the same time, I can title my house in the same LLC. And then I can also put a lien on my vehicle with that same LLC, LLC as the lender. So you see, you can, you can use it for many things. So it's, it's very useful. You don't need to have many different LLCs. Now, there may be a need for that sometimes, but uh, generally when I start these out, I start out in a limited liability company and I use an unincorporated association as its owner unless there's a need to do something else. All right. Yeah, so, so pretty much I just described liens, titles. You want to be careful how you use liens and titles on real estate. Like, for example, if you're in a state that has really good tax exemption, like Florida, California, then and you and you live in the property, it's it's a residential, you may want to keep the title in your name if you lose the exemption, okay? And and to protect the property, then you would just use a lien. Unless we're talking about the IRS. So, you know, th there there are some other risks to consider. Now, the tax liability in this situation, okay, now I'm talking about the limited liability company. That comes from your accounting practice. That does not come from a statute. Just because you have a, an, an LLC with an EIN, with a bank account that makes $3 million in profit one year, that receives a 1099, that does not create a tax liability. That alone does not create an obligation to file a tax return. Here's what does. If the LLC files a tax return, that's when it's obligated to file a tax return. You may want to reverse that, rewind that, and listen to that again because it is that simple. It's the filing of a tax return that creates the duty or obligation to file a tax return. So it's your accounting practice. It's not a law. Okay. Now, I can do this with uh, foreigners, meaning people outside the United States, in Canada, the UK, wherever. Some countries have actually have pretty good uh, LLC laws. Um, but I can set up a company here in the States, and then that company can be used with the service at Caleb and Brown in Australia. That's a very good use. So if you, if you have a decent amount of uh, investment in cryptographic currency and you're thinking of using Caleb and Brown, I mean, my clients have uh, discounts, a uh, pretty good discount. I think it's like 30% on trades. Um, when I set up this structure, my documents are, are easily accepted at Caleb and Brown. Um, I do make a modification for that service. So you let me know if uh, you're in that situation. Um, but that's the easy version of it. Now, once that's set up, that's the fastest way to get into cryptos with zero liability. And keep in mind also, you can buy as many assets as you want. You can buy gold, coins, stock, real estate. You can buy all those things and not have a tax liability. So you can do all that. And again, I write these so that you don't have any ownership interest. However, you do control everything. You make all the rules. It's just that you have zero liability, best of both worlds. So if you're in Canada or UK or somewhere else, as after we settle this up, I like to suggest maybe setting up a local bank account, and there's different ways of doing that. Um, you can actually domesticate the LLC in your country, or you can use a partnership, and you can use the LLC as a general partner. But the idea there is to either eliminate or further reduce any taxable income. So let's say you made $10 million, and then you want to take some of that money 
and put it in, a, in a, an account where you reside, let's say Canada. Well, you want to do it in a way where, let's say you put $10 million there, but at the same time, because of the way we set this up like a partnership or something, you can diminish your taxable liability to like $1 million. So that's not a bad deal. And I'm just saying, I'm just saying that off the top of my head because I don't really know what the tax law is over there. I'm assuming they're very much like they are in the States. They probably are, but just the same, whether or not, I know what they are, you can still strip out the taxable liability by just changing the way you're managing the property rights and the value of that. We even have actually a legal structure here in the States. It's called a, a grantor retained annuity trust, which allows somebody to take a windfall that would otherwise be taxable, put it into this grantor retained annuity trust and strip out half of the equitable taxable value within one year and then strip out 100% of it by a stock devaluation accounting practice, and don't ask me how to do that because there are CPAs that do that. I don't like to do that stuff. And um, within two years, you can have zero tax liability no matter what the gain is. All right, that's a special purpose trust. It's complex. But anyways, there are lots of options. So um, the other thing we can do is we can profit from the, in the LLC, we can, we can realize gains, profits that would otherwise be taxable. We could then spend them on new assets, um, acquire new property. We can even pay off debt, which we could talk about that. Um, I don't always recommend paying off consumer debt in a lump sum, and I'll explain that briefly. Um, we can fund a new asset. We can buy a new asset. Uh, an example of an asset would be something that pays you money, okay? An asset is not your house where you live. An asset would be residential property that you're leasing to someone else, okay? A car that you drive is not an asset. It's not your asset anyways. A fleet of cars that you're leasing out to someone, that's an asset. A boat, mostly, is not an asset. In fact, I did some research on this to see if it would make sense to buy a yacht to make it into an asset, and the, all the dealers kind of laughed at me because they said, no, nah, you're almost never going to make a profit on that sort of deal. Same with the vineyard. So anyways, it's just interesting. But yeah, a, a boat typically is going to be a liability. And then consumer debt. So let's talk about that real quick. So if I, if I pay off consumer debt with a windfall, I could do that, no problem. And this is true pretty much in every country. If I have a nice windfall, I know a lot of people ask me, I'd like to pay off my mortgage and credit card bills. And I say, okay, that's cool. But once you do that, you've just given the bank a huge boost in net present value, internal rate of return. When you already agreed on a certain interest rate, you've just given them a huge interest rate. Why would you do that? Not only did you do that for the bank, you didn't get a benefit. You didn't get a discount. And you're now out that cash flow, which could have increased your net present value. So what I suggest is this. If you want to pay off a mortgage, let's say you have a, a quarter million dollars left on your mortgage. My recommendation is that you look for an asset to acquire with a small portion, a small portion of the $250,000. You want something that's going to cover the debt service, let's call it mortgage, taxes, insurance, maintenance on that property. So let's say it's a nice house that you live in. Instead of paying off the mortgage, I know it's, it sounds like a bit of work, but it's actually, I don't think it is. I think out of the quarter million dollars that you have in your hand, if you take $5,000 and buy into an asset or some sort of cash flow, maybe private equity somewhere, you can generate enough cash flow to offset your liability, your personal liability on the consumer debt and then effectively pay it off with an offset over the life of the debt instead of paying it off in a lump sum and putting yourself in a whole new tax liability and having all this new tax liability because you just paid off a personal debt. It doesn't matter who pays off that debt. It's still considered income. It's taxable income. So why would you put yourself in that situation, okay? So acquire an asset. Use it as a tool, just like you would go shopping for a lawnmower. If you have a big lawn, you get a riding mower. If you have a small lawn, you get a small mower, right? So that's the way I look at it. Use the right tool to handle the, the appropriate liability. What, what is it that you're trying to handle, okay? Don't pay off consumer debt uh, in one lump sum. Um, it's good to have a little bit of debt. Then we get into things like people ask me, okay, that's great. It all sounds good. And now when I have it set up, what happens if something happens to me? <laughs> or, uh, so I like to ask the person, what do you mean if something happens to you? Okay, well, if I die. All right, fine. So if you die, lose your mind, fall into a coma, get lost at sea, disappear, whatever. 
become a hermit somewhere. What's to be done with this treasure you've created and you've left behind? Well, you want to set that up in the beginning. So when you go out and set up, organize everything, and you, you know, start acquiring your wealth or whatever, you want to talk with the people that are, would benefit from this, if that's possible, because sometimes it's not. And you want to get their involvement to some extent. Now, I don't think you want to give them access to everything, because sometimes that's a dangerous thing. But you want to let them know that if you disappear, um, the credentials that give you access to this wealth that you've created uh, are available if they do a one, two, three, whatever that is. So let me just briefly explain what that might be. Instead of putting my important assets into a will, I like having a will, but maybe there's only a dollar in the will. And maybe there's nothing in the will. Because my objective, I hope, is that when I'm gone, nobody has to go to probate for anything. Because probate is a public proceeding where attorneys just pick away at your estate and use it as you know, a way to milk your estate, charge all these fees, become trustees, run you around. And I've just seen so many of these cases that I'm just so sick of it that I just think we can easily plan around it. I mean, we've got technology now. We've got knowledge. We've got methods. We've got you know, cryptographic currency is like an excellent way for, to do estate planning. I'm not an estate planner. I'm not qualified. <clears throat> but I do like a couple of concepts. One concept is keep things out of your estate. It's very simple. If my mom owns a house and she wants to give it to my brother and me, well then, here's one example. I can do a quick claim deed. My mom can sign it. Name me, name herself, and name my brother as the owner of the company, the LLC. We can file a quick claim deed now, or we can file it when she dies. And the property is seamlessly moved out of her estate. It doesn't ever get probated. And then we just continue using that property the same way it was being used before, and there's no controversy, right? It's pretty simple. There's other ways, but I'm just saying that's one example. Here's another example. Um, a lot of people ask to add a spouse or a child onto the structure that I create. You only really need one signer. What happens is, okay, the documents I give you include what's called a banking resolution. So it's just a piece of paper that says the company has authorized Bill Smith to go sign for the bank account, okay? All you have to do if you want to add an authorized user on your account, on your business account, is you copy that document, and I made it so that you can edit these. And you just replace your name with the other person's name, give that to the bank, the other person gives his ID to the bank, just like he was opening, you know, opening a new account, and that person's added as an authorized user. Now, that is not necessary, in my opinion, because, like, for example, my wife will sign for my companies, and I use the companies. I can write checks on the companies. I can log on to the account. I can spend money. I can put money there. I can use its debit card. Even my wife's, is, wife's name is on there, and I can go use the debit card. I do that sometimes. She does that with my things. We just do it because however it works out, okay? I'm lucky because my, my family is pretty good about working together on things like that. Maybe your situation is not so friendly, let's say. So we can work, work through that. Um, for convenience, I have a signature stamp. Uh, my wife has one. I have one. We keep them in a vault. There are ways of using signature stamps, and I can show you that uh, with a business. There's a professional way to do it where we have written limitations on the use of that stamp, and it's to protect everyone. So that way, if someone acquires the stamp through a theft, people don't have the wrong liability. So, so we can talk about that. Um, but accessing uh, money, wealth, property rights can be done through mostly credentials, um, like user ID and password, right? A check. Like, for example, let's say I'm using a corporate account and my wife doesn't sign on it. She doesn't even know about it. And if I disappeared, she'll go through my things to find out how to get control over the things I was using, okay? Money, property, whatever. And she'll find a set of instruction, which I will already have left. Uh, with, like, for example, one check in there, like a bank account, right? So here's a simple example. So I'll have an account on a corporation that my wife doesn't know about, not because I'm hiding it from her, just because it's just the way I just did that way. I don't know. And I have a check or, you know, you can always go get a check. It's not a big deal. But let's say I have a check. I use it. I put it in a document somewhere, and I put it in a vault. When my wife goes to get it, she can see the check, and she could take my signature stamp, or she can forge my name, or it's already signed, and all she has to do is go online, log in, 
and see how much money is there, and then write a check on the account and clear the funds and pay another account. That's an example of how that would work. Again, I avoid probate, drama, all this stuff. It's all done secretly, privately. Um, the other way to do it is you can use a pre-signed instrument, a quick claim deed. Um, there's, there's other examples, but let's just say quick claim deed. Um, another way to do it is where other people need to access the property, the wealth, the tool that you created, the portfolio, when you're not around, when you're gone forever, um, you can actually have something called third-party custody. I'm sure there are other terms for this. But let me give you an example. All right, so I have a vault, and I'm just saying hypothetically. So I have a vault, got some gold in there. There's a vault combination. I like the mechanical kind. So I have a vault combination, and I've written it into a book, and that book is in a safe place, and there's a backup somewhere. And I took a shoebox, and I put that information in the shoebox on a piece of paper, let's say. Or maybe I put it in some plastic so it's going to last. And then I seal the box with a tamper evidence seal. And I give it to, under a contract, I give it to a law firm. Now, I'm not saying I like attorneys. I'm just saying attorneys are good for this role because they're bonded. That means they're financially liable for this type of thing. Not only that, I like attorneys for the attorney-client privilege I can get doing these types of things. So if I make it a shoe box or a plastic box or even one of those like till – type vault things you can buy at Walmart and I have a tamper tamper evidence seal on there and I put the thing in there and I give it to the attorney and then there's under the contract some conditions have to be met so that if one a member of my family wants to go get that when I'm gone they would they would know what to do they would go to this third party custodian and they would provide whatever ID or whatever is necessary and then the contract that I have with that firm would be fulfilled when they deliver that item to my family member, you see? And then once that happens, my wife or whoever can get into the box, vault, and do the thing, whatever that's supposed to be. So you can be as creative as you want. I mean, some of you guys may not like that idea. Um, the reason why I like it is because if I go to an attorney, um, it's going to be expensive unnecessarily. I don't mind spending money for something, but I don't really need an attorney to write up a bunch of documents and then drag my property rights through a public forum where everyone can pick at them, okay, or make up some whatever to do that. I like, I like to keep it private. Um, I want to get into a little bit about the PMA. People ask me that a lot. A private membership association is – we use them all the time. We participate in them all the time. An example of a PMA would be your group of friends that you go hang out with on Saturday. Okay, that's a PMA. It could be the people that work in your office, right? They're, the thing they have in common is that they work in the office with you, okay? Um, the PMA is the owner of the limited liability company, if that's the way you set it up. You can do it with two members also. Um, I'm going to explain about that in a second. The PMA has no articles. That doesn't mean you can't write them. So here's an example of how I would write PMA articles. I would start writing a document that says the name of the PMA is this, the date of its formation is this, um, the membership of the PMA is this, and maybe that might include me, my, me, my wife, uh, two children, let's say, and uh, maybe it's going to include four other people for some reason, aunts, uncles, cousins, whatever. And then out of that group, I'm going to pick three people. Let's say it's going to be myself, uh, my son, and my cousin, let's just say. So those three people in that group I just listed are going to be considered the board of directors or the trustees, whatever. I'm going to say that in my articles. And then those three people make the important decisions. And they do that for the benefit of the beneficiaries who are named one, two, three. And the beneficiaries are everyone else besides the board. Or maybe it does include the board. It just depends on how you guys want to do it. So see how you do this? You identify the organization, the membership, who has control, then what the voting rights are, maybe um, what property the PMA could own. And again, this is a private in-house, in-family, secret document. It's just for making sure no one forgets who's supposed to do what or who has what 
rights. So this is a, an effective method. You can take an investment firm like an LLC that, that I would set up for you, and then you can use the inside structure of it to roll out and develop an estate plan for yourself. And you'd be su surprised. You can start even using some smart, smart contract technology in your PMA to manage property rights. And we'll get into that in other um, discussions. But I just want to say, you know, some of these items, I want to cover it as part of, uh, let's call it the free consultation, because I do cover a lot of this um, uh, during these calls. Uh, the other thing is keep in mind, you can, uh, you don't need these structures to buy assets. So if you wanted to, you could just wait and not set up any structure at all, open your accounts the way you want, buy, 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 put your cash after tax money, before tax money, it's up to you, whatever you want to do. Buy cryptographic currency, buy gold, buy stock. And then when you may, may have a tax liability, you want to set up a structure that can handle the tax liability in a way that you could defer it perpetually, like an LLC. There are other ways, but I'm just saying. At the time you're going to have a tax liability, use a thing, a structure that can handle it. So let's say I bought a bunch of coins, I put $100,000 in, and now it's worth a million dollars in the same year. And I'm going to take my million dollars out in dollars. So then I would open up a limited liability company account at an exchange somewhere. Somewhere where I can move my wallet, my coins from one wallet to my same coins to a different wallet where the LLC has an account. So I move from my personal account to my LLC account, Bitcoin wallet to Bitcoin wallet, okay? And when I say that, people go, ah, wait, wait a minute, there's a tax liability. No, there's not. Because remember, I still have the same beneficial interest. I'm still in control. There, there is no other interest here, I, obviously. I'm the only one. I'm making all the decisions, right? I'm the one thinking this through. I didn't confer with anybody else. Maybe I did, but if I did, chances are I also conferred with that person on my personal account because, you know, husband and wife, do they do that too, hopefully. So I can move from my personal account to my LLC account. Beneficial interests don't change. There is no profit. There is no gain. I don't need to make some complicated contract. I don't need a loan agreement like you guys talk about. I don't need a gift contract, a gifty affidavit, none of that stuff. Just go from my personal account to my LLC account. Now, I could then sell the property. I've done this with stock, real estate. I've done this at the last second, right before a closing, uh, within a week or two of a stock sale. Completely avoids capital gains taxes. Legally, on the record, you can see everything. Iris looks at it and says, yeah, we don't see any problem here. Done it many, many times. So that's kind of cool. Understand you can do that. Last note I'm going to make. If you have a situation where you have a 1099 in your name from an exchange, 1099 for you guys outside the states just means that um, a third party is reporting to our tax people that you made some money. Whether or not it's taxable, it's up to you to, you know, whatever your tax situation is. But it's just that they're notifying the tax authority that, like in our case, the IRS, that you received some money. Okay. Now, if your LLC receives a 1099, cool, because you can avoid a tax liability if you follow the proper accounting practice. If you got a 1099, and I've seen this before, I, had, I worked with a gentleman, he had, I think it was $40,000 in one of the exchanges, and he got a 1099 for about $900,000 in taxes. Well, that doesn't make any sense. So if you get a 1099 where the dollar amount is erroneous, you can have it corrected, but you have to write a certain kind of letter to the IRS. And I include that in my service. So I don't charge money for that if you're already a client. So basically, it's a six-page letter, the form letter I got from the IRS. I write that up. It's my own memorandum of law. I send it to the Secretary of the Treasury. And so they do one of two things. They write a letter back and they say, okay, we agree that you do not need to add your 1099. You do not need to report that 1099 on your 1040, on your tax return. And that's what we tell them. We just say, we're not going to do that. And the IRS says, yeah, good. Or the IRS says nothing. So either way, um, that's how it works. So we can fix a 1099 if you have that situation. Now, to the extent you didn't take dollars. If you did sell for, for some dollars, we're going to include that on your 1040, and we'll let them know. I have to adjust the uh, form letter uh, to, to let them know. But basically, that is... 
that covers most of the items that we uh, discuss on a free consultation. Now, that doesn't mean you, you can't call me on a free consultation. Please, I invite you to do that. I'd be more than happy to talk with you. But hopefully, this gives you um, information uh, it's, that's the most pertinent. And I wrote an article that maybe if you still want to discuss this with, with your accountant, um, the, the article is called, Where's the Crypto Tax? So I'm going to put that somewhere connected with this video. I'm not sure yet. So that way, you can just download it. If you don't see it, ask me by email. Uh, my email address is singletonpress at protonmail.com. All right, well, thanks for listening. Hope that helps you. Have a good day.